Now I'd like to call up Peter Hasrick. Well, this is an informal talk, probably the old art history talk you'll get. So uh, no sleeping. I can't see you because of the light in my eyes, but let's go through this. Uh, this is a talk about two artists, one of a performing artist, Mr. Cody, and Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney, a sculptor, but also two main, main major uh, patrons of the art who uh, had an impact on this institution and the formation of our great art collection, making Cody, the town, and this museum uh, one, of the, uh, one of the most important of the Western art museums uh, in, in, in America. So we have on the screen here a, a picture of Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney, 1923. She's just in the process of, of uh, shaping the form of that big statue out on the north side of the property called Buffalo Bill the Scout. Uh, 1922, she had received the commission early in the year to do that, and she had come out here with her son Cornelius that summer to see Yellowstone Park and to visit Cody and to select a site for that sculpture. She purchased 40 acres of land, which ultimately in 1935 were given to this Memorial Association because Denver didn't want it. <laughs> <laughs> now they're both patrons of the arts. Uh, uh, Mrs. Whitney collected the Ashcan School and Buffalo Bill collected the Outback School of Art but, and, 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 and formed this collection. So. Uh, here's Mr. Cody in 1910. His fortunes have waned a bit, uh, but in the decade uh, of 1900 to 1910, he's quite a patron of the arts. And why does he have to be a patron of the arts? Uh, because he had the Brown Palace of the North uh, here, his crown jewel, the Irma Hotel, and he had to fill it with something so people would actually come there and stay. And so he started looking around for artists. In 1902, he meets this fellow, uh, Irving Bacon in Detroit, and he invites Bacon to come to his, after, after the season each year, Mr. Cody would have a, a hunting trip into the mountains here, and he invited Mr. Bacon, and Bacon uh, uh, painted this affectionate in the French tradition because he'd studied in the art school in Detroit uh, this portrait of Buffalo Bill and his hunting group. Uh, now, he, Buffalo Bill was not his only patron. This other guy happened to have a little more money uh, and uh, decided to help him go back to school. So he went to the Munich Academy and studied with a madman, Karl von Marr. And von Marr had a lot of influences on many American artists from the Royal Academy, uh, but one was virtuoso brushwork. Uh, and so uh, he instructed him in doing that, and, and Mr. Bacon produced two uh, versions of this painting called Conquest of the Prairie in 1908, after a couple of years studying with Bon Mar. Now, this is one of those legacy paintings. It's a conquest of the prairie painting, Buffalo Bill leading the wagons, leading the trains, leading the cities into the west, and the poor animals scurry away in fear, and the Indians are cast in the shadow and always see the butts of their horses. Uh, so this was uh, commissioned, or at least sold to Buffalo Bill, and it became a part of the Irma Hotel collection. Uh, and we can see in this detail, of course, you can see that virtuoso brushwork. Uh, we don't have a lot of time to go into it, but uh, we do have some comparisons. This is the second artist that uh, Buffalo Bill found, and uh, he found him in San Francisco. He'd grown up in St. Louis and studied at Washington University in the French technique as well, uh, mostly following the, the dictates of, of Jean-Léon Jérôme. Uh, these are two little portraits of Indians looking at their past uh, through paintings and constructs that have been uh, presented to them by uh, Anglo artists. This is probably a commission piece that uh, uh, he purchased from the, uh, uh, and it showed, it's a, a trompe l'oeil painting showing, showing Buffalo Bill and a carte de visite above and, and everything that had passed uh, from the West by that time, including Wild Bill Hickok, with whom he's often uh, confused there at the bottom in Sitting Bull. And then there's a painting that I, I can't uh, interpret. <laughs> uh, it too is by Bacon and it needs a, a psychoanalysis to, to <laughs> decide what these uh, little cherubs are doing by uh, uh, disrobing this poor little white girl and tying her to a tree and turning her to toast. 
Uh, but uh, on, the, on the horizon there, on the left-hand side, is her boyfriend uh, paddling up to save her. And so it's a reverse Pocahontas kind of a situation. This uh, hung in his bedroom at the uh, T.E. Ranch. The third artist uh, we would like to introduce is uh, Charles Stobie from Denver. He was a scout in the, in the hunt of 1903. Uh, a lot of his old army scouts were invited by Buffalo Bill, Stobie being one of them, and Stobie told him that he trained in Scotland as a painter. And so Buffalo Bill gave him $250 to do a similar kind of thing that Bacon had done a year before, and he sent him this picture. And Buffalo Bill hated it. He said, God, can't you do something better? I'll think I'll, I'll, think I'll return it to you. Uh, I don't know whether he did. I think probably <laughs> Stobie wanted another couple hundred to, to make changes, and so Buffalo Bill just kept it. Uh, and there it sits in our collections today. The fourth artist uh, is uh, a fellow who also studied with von Maar. Uh, in Germany uh, named Charles Schreibel. You see him here being held up by one of his models who's going to shoot his right kneecap off if he doesn't hurry with his, with his sketch. Uh, the painting 1899 of my bunkie, which hangs in the Metropolitan Museum today, um, was a sensation uh, that year at the National Academy of Design, and Schreibel was, was catapulted into uh, fame uh, by the acquisition of this painting by a major New York collector and uh, uh, he won the Thomas Clark Award of $300, so he was in good shape uh, and could upgrade the furniture in his Hoboken studio. Uh, in 1908, Buffalo Bill commissioned uh, several uh, legacy paintings from Schreibogel, and this is the one surviving and only one he ever completed uh, called the Summit Springs Rescue. And there's Buffalo Bill trying to uh, save at least one of the fair damsels named Witchell fr from uh, uh, tall bull Cheyennes having abducted them. Uh, the important thing for this talk is not to analyze this picture, which I'm sure will be analyzed later, uh, but is to say that Buffalo Bill paid him in a painted teepee, a Kai teepee, the artist was paid this, and a handful of Oracle mining stock, which was worth absolutely nothing, and uh, so the uh, 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 subsequent uh, commission was uh, canceled. <laughs> and we only have the one painting. Now, here's Frederick Remington. Now, Frederick Remington hated Schreibogel. He'd been putting uh, paintings in the National Academy of Design uh, for 12 years before this. We see his first submission, uh, this rather noble portrait of a, uh, a black cavalry man in the 9th Cavalry in Arizona. Uh, and uh, he'd been hoping to become a formal National Academician. This is uh, Remington's aspiration. Uh, in 1899, when Schreibogel got all that attention, uh, this is the painting he submitted called Missing. Uh, they still didn't give him a, a National Academy uh, uh, title, and so he quit the Academy. Now, he did work for Buffalo Bill indirectly. Uh, some of his paintings, illustrations from the Theodore Roosevelt book uh, were uh, picked up by, I don't know what was a nice word for it, uh, by Buffalo Bill and made into posters. We don't know whether the Calhoun uh, Publishing Company ever paid him for these, but those were long times before copyright laws. We do know that he was uh, commissioned to do two portraits or two paintings uh, in uh, Buffalo Bill's sister's biography, and uh, they appear, including this one, which is in the collections here. Uh, in that book, we presume he was paid as an illustrator for the book. Uh, uh, Cody and his sister split $80,000 the first year. The books cost 14 cents to publish and sold them for a dollar at the Wild West show. Buffalo Bill could afford uh, a set of the, uh, the uh, Bunch of Buckskins portfolio uh, that was produced in 1902. Another artist that came under the wing of Buffalo Bill was, uh, was uh, Rosa Bonheur, the most famous woman artist in France at the time. This painting is, which hangs in the Metropolitan Museum today. The Horse Fair was her most famous work, given, in fact, by, by Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney's father to the Metropolitan in 1887. Uh, we hear that he went to, uh, to uh, Paris in 1889. Uh, he befriended uh, Rosa, and there is uh, Red Shirt on the right and uh, uh, Rocky Bear on the left. Rocky Bear is a pretty big guy. <laughs> 
uh, sort of dwarfs Buffalo Bill. But they're all invited to Fontainebleau by Rosa, and he, she paints this legacy picture of Buffalo Bill, which he decides not to buy. <laughs> It had to be given to the museum later. And Rocky Bear and Red Shirt uh, in the background. Is Red Shirt wearing that uh, vest? Can you see? I, ca I can't see. I can't see. I'm sure he was. And this is how, how the legacy picture ends up. Uh, Buffalo Bill on the right, Rosa Bonheur in the middle painting the little portrait, and uh, Mr. Napoleon who needs a good couple of sessions at Pilates on the left. Now we jump 20 years ahead because I only have 10 minutes left. I can do 20 years, <laughs> 10 minutes. <laughs> to uh, Madison Square Gardens, this isn't Madison Square Gardens, but, it, but it, at Madison Square Gardens one night, Mrs. Whitney and her three children, Cornelius, Alice, and, and uh, I can't think of her name, uh, I'll, I'll get it later, uh, come and sit in the VIP, one of the VIP booths, and Buffalo Bill knows who's in this VIP booth. And the first act of the Wild West show was the, the Deadwood stage, and it would come circle around, it would be attacked by Indians, and it would be saved by the cowboys. But it stopped that night in front of Mrs. Whitney's booth, and, and the driver asked Mr. Whitney if he'd like to, here's Mr. Whitney, if he'd like to ride in the Deadwood stage, and of course he did. And he got a, attacked by the Indians, he got saved by the cowboys, and he got dumped back in Mama's lap. And he and his mama never forgot that. In his autobiography, Mr. Whitney writes uh, that that was, uh, devotes a chapter to this episode and writes that it was the most memorable uh, moment in his childhood. And Gertrude, I'm sure, uh, shared that. Now here's Buffalo Bill. Uh, he passed away in 1917, was buried in Denver, of course. And uh, we all know it's fake history that a bunch of drunken cowboys from Cody went down to try to exhume the body and that they were met by a World War I tank. <laughs> <coughs> this is fake history, but it's good, isn't it? <laughs> we like this. Uh, and Jeremy has told me none of that is true, but we do know that several so sober-sided uh, uh, trustees from Cody went down to the legislature and they were given a $5,000 appropriation uh, if they ever did anything as a memorial to Buffalo Bill in Cody. And that brings us to uh, Carolyn Lockhart, uh, and the, she ran the uh, newspaper here, and a letter she wrote. Can you read the letter? It's really wonderful, the first paragraph. I can't read it on the screen here, it's too little. But it says, it, the second paragraph, it says that they're gonna take the money back if we don't do something fast, and would he please ask Mrs. Whitney if she'd do an equestrian statue? Have you ever seen that letter? I've never seen it, it's a fabulous letter. So she sends this letter to Mr. W.R. Coe on the right, who has ranching properties here, and to Colonel Arthur Little, who also has ranching properties here and they decide to talk to Mrs. Whitney. She says she probably could do it, uh, and uh, she wants to uh, uh, maybe charge about $50,000. So what do they do? They send a woman in to do the job. Her name is Mary Jester Allen, and uh, aside from, the, uh, or in addition to their hairdresser, which they share, uh, <laughs> uh, they have several things in common. One is a memory that, uh, that, uh, that uh, Gertrude had of the Buffalo Bill Wild West show, uh, and uh, the other is th that they were very much involved in things American. Mrs. Whitney wanted to uh, collect American artists and have an American museum, and so she accepts the commission and says she'll pay for the she'll pay the tab. Now, why would she want to do that? Well, she, there's a number of other artists. So you see a couple of them here. Anna Hyatt and uh, Sally Farnham, who have just received big commissions to do uh, big Western, or big, big equestrian sculptures for New York. Uh, Sally's a wealthy woman. She lives uh, in this modest bungalow on the North Shore of Long Island with her husband, Paulding Farnham, who's the main designer for Charles Tiffany in New York. Uh, she's a great horsewoman, and she is given a commission to uh, do an equestrian sculpture of Maduro. I mean, I mean, uh, uh, Simon Boulevard. Uh, nobody even caught that. <laughs> Sorry about that. I'm going too fast, huh? Uh, and uh, which is uh, put into the into park into the city park at at that time. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, Anna Hyatt had just done a similar commission, uh, Joan of Arc, on Riverside Drive. Uh, both of those sculptures are still existing. So now it's now it's. Uh, it's, it's Gertrude's turn. 
Uh, she modifies her studio in Glen Cove, New York to accommodate. Uh, the floor comes down her, uh, uh, hydraulically and she's able to do this and, and, and uh, Mrs. Allen sends a horse and a, a Wyoming cowboy to model from and she produces this uh, in the winter of 1924. It's exhibited in uh, Central Park. What did you say that was? Oh God, I can slow this down. In 1924, J July the 4th, she, uh, uh, the, the, the piece is unveiled in Cody on the plinth that she has designed on the land that she owns. In uh, 1935, she gives that land to the, the Buffalo Bill Memorial Association. I think I mentioned that. So they have $5,000. They buy a little land adjacent to Mrs. Whitney's land and put in the first Buffalo Bill Museum in 1927, which uh, Paul... Uh, referred to, and uh, Mary Jester Allen and Mrs. Whitney remain very close friends for the rest of their lives. When Mrs. Whitney's husband, uh, Harry Payne Whitney, died in 1930, it was Mary Jester Allen's condolence letter that struck Mrs. Whitney the, the most sincerely. She said she read it over and over and over again. And so these two women had something in common. Uh, throughout their lives. Uh, Mrs. Whitney dies in 1942. Uh, her daughter Flora, the one I couldn't think of before, uh, is given the, uh, uh, the role of furthering the Whitney Museum in New York, and her son Cornelius Vanderbilt Whitney is given the role of doing something out west, uh, an, a, a, a western art museum in Cody if they ever get any art. Well, Mary Jester Allen had just bought this picture. You see the, the elk admiring it there. <laughs> and so she had some art and she invites uh, Mr. Whitney uh, to Cody to see the rodeo and the 4th of July parade and to see her art collection. Now there it is, Robert Leno. He also had studied in Munich under Franz von Stuck. And he was an Art Nouveau painter. Uh, I don't think Bob Leno learned much uh, it's a pretty awful painting, but uh, it's very important historically. The, the first sc sc uh, scalp for Custer, and he's holding not, not the scalp, but the, uh, but the war bonnet of this poor Cheyenne. And I call it uh, Yellow Hand's face plant for history. <laughs> it didn't sway Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Whitney to give any money, uh, but this gallery bought the Remington Studio Collection in about 1957, uh, and this fellow on the left, Robert Coe, uh, sees that painting, and, uh, or sees a group of paintings in the window at, N at Nodler's, oops, went the wrong way, at Nodler's, and gets uh, into his uh, uh, car and calls his brothers and his sister and says, we've got to buy this if the museum in Cody wants it. Of course, Ernest Goppert, who's the chairman of the board, says we do want it, but ring off, I need to call Mr. Whitney, and he calls Mr. Whitney, he says we now have some art, uh, could you send us some money in honor of your mother's wishes, uh, which he does, uh, and uh, Mr. Whitney sends a check for $250,000 uh, to build the Whitney Museum. This is what the studio looked like in the New Rochelle, you can see it's full of artifacts as well as sketches and paintings. There were 113 paintings in the collection alone. The Whitney Gallery is built in 1959 and opened, and you can see uh, the inaugural exhibition, including the Shriver Girl painting uh, in the middle of the exhibit there, and its director, uh, Harold McCracken, uh, proudly stands in front of the studio collection as it was initially installed in the museum. Mr. Whitney, though he looks a bit sleepy here, uh, is uh, gratified to come and see the opening and to reacquaint himself with Mary Jester Allen, uh, who's looking very grumpy, but, uh, but Mama's statue is out back, and Mr. Whitney is, in fact, very encouraged by the collection of materials that uh, Dr. McCracken has assembled for this inaugural exhibition, and he says, Harold, let's go look at some of this art. I'll write you another check for another $250,000, and we'll just get some of this stuff. including this great Remington painting, uh, Prospecting for Cattle Range, uh, this important painting by Hayes of Buffalo on the Upper Missouri, painted in, in uh, 63, uh, this uh, painting uh, by um, 
by Bierstadt, The Last of the Buffalo, one of the great treasures, and uh, a painting done in September 1895 by the great Impressionist John Twachman. So we have to thank these two people, Gertrude for her energy as an artist, her patronage of, uh, of her own art in a way, uh, but of the, the idea that a Western art museum could somehow take shape out here, and for Buffalo Bill providing the subject and the energy to collect himself and to be a part of this uh, great artistic legacy here. And I thank you all for listening as my nose doesn't stop running. Thank you. Well, how about another round of applause for all of our speakers for this panel? I would say we're off to a great start. So we have some time for questions. Linda, if you could turn the house lights on. And uh, there will be people with wireless mics passing them through the, the audience. And please, if you have a question, ask your question into the mic, and our speakers will be happy to provide you an answer. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm Jennifer from the Denver Art Museum. So my question is museum related. <laughs> Peter, your talk reminds me of how um, as curators, we are often the inheritors of experiences that have been crafted years before our time. So for example, the Whitney collection is money that was given based off of this young boy's incredible experience of Buffalo Bill's Wild West. And that got me thinking about how Buffalo, the legacy of Buffalo Bill's Wild West is really one that is experiential. You, know, you had to be there to really experience it. So in context of all the institutions on behalf of which you spoke today, how do you make that experience living and vibrant for your audience? And museums are uh, known for, for the static displays they often display and the textual interpretation. But Buffalo Bill's Wild West presents a particularly interesting oh. challenge because it really is about being there in the moment at that time. And if you could speak generally or specifically to how you and your experience you have confronted that challenge, that would be really interesting for me as a curator personally to hear. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Way to pitch out an easy question there. So <laughs> uh, if you would, if the speakers would please come up and answer Jennifer's question. Well, welcome, Jennifer. Yeah, that's a tough one. I don't know. We have one sculpture in the in the Whitney that's uh, kinetic. Hey, well, well, well. I mean, this is all hang on the wall kind of 19th century stuff, early 20th century stuff. So it is a difficult thing. The the the, the, the curatorial staff here gets gets children involved in actually drawing and doing art in the galleries, and uh, there are artists who come and do artists in residence in the galleries working from these things, but it's, but art is fairly static until you get into cinematography. Um, and so it's, it's hard to make these things come alive without getting somebody holding the painting up. Uh, you guys probably have much more interesting comments. I don't think more interesting, but uh, the, the challenge to a in a museum is to tell the story well. And um, if the story is told well, and the uh, subject is made vivid through the storytelling, then the objects become exciting just as objects. Uh, the, um, the objects become a link between the person and the narrative. So uh, a thing uh, ends up having a great deal more life, even if you can't touch it. If you can, if you can look at it and, and think of the connection and see the context and, uh, and sort of feel it vicariously then, or in the case of a painting, if you can look into it and, and put yourself into the narrative of the painting, uh, that provides that kind of excitement I think you're talking about. At least I think it does. I'm pretty old fashioned. So, sweet. Well, Peter mentioned cinematography and 
Jennifer, I've got to say, and maybe this was planted this way on purpose, you've done a wonderful job at the Denver Art Museum of combining art, artifacts, and cinematography in this latest exhibit. Now, would you say the title for me? Because The Western and Epic in Art and Film. I've been to see it twice now. I would heartily recommend that you make the trip down to Denver to catch that, as well as another exhibit that I think does very well, a combination of artifacts and art at History Colorado called Backstory. So a uh, good excuse to go to Denver and um, visit Buffalo Bill's favorite watering hole while you're there, uh, the Buckhorn Saloon. All right, we have a few questions over here, so we'll take Dr. White. Just a, a uh, Tim, if you yeah. would please use the microphone. Oh, microphone. I, I, microphones make me nervous. <laughs> Just a, a comment, those of us who, who love museums uh, get enraptured with the, uh, with the excitement of, of objects being held and experienced. I think that's true. And if I understood your comment, it looks forward, uh, not backward and not self-congratulatory. Uh, at the moment. Um, virtual reality and computer graphics offer opportunities going forward that have not been explored by museums for objects. Context can be created historically and visually and uh, colorfully in ways that we really haven't scratched yet. And it will be seen as an absurd and offensive notion when it's first experienced but we must be prepared that people who are now eight years old and 20 years from now will be junior curators at museums around the world are gonna be looking for ways to animate, to narrate these objects across time in ways that we've never been able to do and it wouldn't have occurred to us to do. So I think we best not pause in the moment but project forward, which is what you're doing. It, we have a question up here, Gregory, and then we'll get back to you, Karen. Hi, uh, Gregory Hinton. Uh, I, I, uh, for Peter, I, I so enjoyed the analogies between uh, Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney and, and Rosa Bonheur, and I've, since Gertrude was only 12 when Cornelius bought the horse fair, is there, uh, did that somehow, did, did Bonheur ever uh, inspire um, uh, uh, Gertrude, do you think, in to, to become an animal, you're herself? You, you, there, is, there is a connection, and it's a, a, a very genuine one between uh, the two women. And uh, Mrs. Whitney, uh, Rose Bonheur was a hero to Mrs. Whitney. Uh, but I don't, I've not looked into it. The, the research uh, is just coming forward on that question, on that uh, point. Uh, but I can see that Mrs. Whitney trying to be an independent woman in her day, doing things to sponsor art in her day that um, no woman artist or patron would have either done or could have afforded to do, uh, put her at a, a level par, par with, uh, with Miss Bonheur. And I think that, uh, I think she recognized that. And I'm sure as that, scholarship comes forward that uh, we'll, we'll see lots of other insights into that relationship, but they, they did know each other and they did, uh, they did um, uh, Mrs. Whitney did appreciate her. And when she went to France, she studied with Rodin and uh, uh, whether she met Miss Bonheur at that time, I don't know. Uh, but you can see in her other sculpture besides Buffalo Bill, it's kind of interesting, you can see that Rodin-esque sort of interiority uh, hunched over kind of humanity uh, in her work, and then she does Buffalo Bill. Boom! The guy's up there and alive and well, and uh, representing the American spirit. Uh, so, uh, not all of, of French artists inspired her, but I think Rosa did. Thank you. And then uh, Karen McCorder back here. Well, I see your hand, Pete. We'll get to you here. Thank you. I just wanted well, to Karen, mention to Jennifer right, that you'll appreciate our panel this afternoon from 4 to 6, 430 to 6. Um, I'll be chatting along with my colleagues. All of the curators here will be talking exactly to your question. How is it that we grapple with the history of Buffalo Bill within each of our specialties? 
And I know I can say that at present, um, we offer synesthetic opportunities, also try to incorporate multiple voices, providing for dynamism with, um, while avoiding you know, too great a level of infotainment. So we'll talk about that later, it'll be good. Thank you, Karen. And Patty? So I'm preoccupied with humor, and the three of you are really funny, which I will just stop there. No, I won't stop there. Um, so I'm wondering about humor in thinking about the West from these various figures who were curating, who were acquiring, who were uh, interpreting and building museums. Is humor about this whole era of the westward expansion, the myth of the West and its representations, is that a retrospective thing that we are privileged to have now? Do you see humor in, the uh, Indian people were surely getting a laugh or two out of their experience of being taken to Europe. And so I'm just wondering if you were now asked to look back over your remarks and, and tell us if you can see humor of the people of the time as they're looking at their uh, myth, their stories, their interpretation of it, are they chuckling or do we have to wait for you guys to start uh, recognizing the humor in this? All right, so we're going to begin evening at the improv starting with <laughs> Paul here. That's a really interesting question. Um, to, uh, to answer that, you sort of have to look at, uh, at the uh, candid photographs that came out of the Wild West. There's even a picture of Annie Oakley laughing. You can see her teeth. Um, and, uh, and, and yet she's so serious in her public persona. There are numerous photographs of um, Indian people joking, laughing. You probably all have seen that photograph of a group of war bonneted men playing ping pong in the Wild West. I think humor was uh, important and certainly Cody himself had a sense of humor. Uh, uh, here at this symposium years ago, I told an anecdote which I think illustrates that sense of humor very well and his quickness of thought. When he was introduced uh, at a dinner in London, a dinner of military officers, and in the, um, in the uh, toasts afterward, one of the subalterns, kind of a snotty young man apparently, um, said, oh, you Yankees with your inflated titles, like Colonel, come over here and try to wow the rest of us. And uh, I think if you keep doing that, we'll have to come over there to the US and give you a licking. And uh, the whole room fell silent in horror as the generals all wondered how their guest of honor was gonna respond. Cody stood up, lifted his glass and said, what, again? <laughs> There's a lot of humor in the show. There's humor even in the, uh, even in the, uh, the, the ephemera. One of the best essays on the cowboy is J uh, Texas Jack's commentary on uh, the view from the hurricane deck of a bucking bronco, which is, uh, which is very lively and self-deprecating. Uh, and, um, and as I said, if you look closely at the photographs, you're gonna see a lot of grinning, mugging, digging, and uh, probably a lot of verbal humor too. Was a coping mechanism for all of them. Think about all those different people having to live together in that uh, big tent. And, and Paul, I think it was you that showed me that letter in Don Russell's archives, was it? Where it was uh, written, I don't know when, uh, about Queen Victoria. Steve is referring here. Steve is referring here to a wonderful uh, invitation, phony, uh, fake, fake invitation. It's pasted in the back of the invitation book for Buffalo Bill. The Buffalo Bill's publicist, or perhaps he himself, kept his invitations and notes during that 1887 season in a in a, in a scrapbook. The very back of the scrapbook has an invitation, a picture of a crown initials VR, and it says, uh, Bill, uh, come up after the show, and uh, the champagne's on ice. P.S. Bring red shirt. Love, Vic R. 
And also, as a matter of humor, uh, Buffalo Bill's grandson, Fred Garlow, whom many of us here knew and loved, uh, thought it was real and <laughs> wished it were real, even <laughs> if it weren't. You know. Incidentally, just a remark, I, I wanted to congratulate Steve on, uh, on his acknowledgment that Buffalo Bill died in Denver and then asked to be buried there. <laughs> Oh man, this is a whole can of worms. We don't want to get into it. Let's see, we have time for a couple more questions. So down here at Frank, we'll get up to you then, Ernest. I'm curious about the um, logic of debunking. Uh, Paul, you were talking about um, this period in the, in the mid 20th century when um, a certain counter narrative developed around the myth of Buffalo Bill. And uh, that particular quote, um, I think you said it was from the New York Times, um, describing him as an average person who forged himself into, I can't remember the rest of the quote, it's you know, a figure of national, interna international renown. So that's, I wonder if you could just unpack that a little bit. Like what, what would um, a claim like that actually mean? Because to me it reads like, um, Abraham Lincoln was born in a log cabin and became President of the United States. Like that's evidence of something extraordinary. If an average person forges himself into a figure of international renown, that's a mythic statement right there. You know, what exactly was the, the puncturing of the myth getting at? That is a wonderful statement, uh, that one that uh, Malcolm Rohrbaugh made. It's, um, it, it was in response to, um, it's in response to Buffalo Bill's representing, and this is, this is his role as a symbol in myth, is to represent the myth, to Buffalo Bill's role in representing everything that was wrong about myth of the West. Um, you know, people were uh, worried about the destruction of the environment the wiping out of the buffalo, and uh, uh, Buffalo Bill represents that. People were, were remarking on, uh, in the, again in the 1980s, also in the 1920s, but people were looking at the myth of the West as being uh, something that uh, allowed us somehow, somehow it empowered us to mistreat Indian people, to conquer, truly to conquer to colonize them, to send them off to be uh, shorn and, uh, and de-Indianized at uh, those schools. Um, Buffalo Bill is the representative of that particular myth to those people. Uh, and at the end of that Reagan era, when, uh, we, were, uh, when we were practicing diplomacy militarily by uh, sending out our troops to, uh, to or when we were enlisting you know, friendly folks in Vietnam or wherever it was, wherever it might be, enlisting the friendlies to oppose the hostiles and uh, practicing that kind of Indian Wars diplomacy, um, Buffalo Bill, in the minds of people who look no deeper than the myth of the West as, uh, as a construct, uh, settled on him as the exemplar for those negative aspects of the myth. The same thing happened actually in his lifetime but um, certainly in the 1920s, the same impulse was at work with the disillusionment of intellectuals uh, as Europe crashed in uh, the First World War and the United States became involved and Woodrow Wilson was so regressive on many of his uh, social and racial policies. Um, that myth of the West is what, uh, which, which, seemed, which was such an important part of our understanding of American progress um, became the uh, culprit for empowering our leaders, our leadership, empowering the American people to, to go down that path and Buffalo Bill as the face of that myth, as the reigning icon, was easy to, uh, to blame and to debunk. Um, I think that's uh, in each, maybe in each generation that's been the case, uh, but certainly you know, he represents that myth for good or for ill for us. And, uh, and because of that, 
um, we're all here. <laughs> Um, because of that, his importance won't wane as long as we, uh, as long as we are examining and re-examining the role of the American West in American life. All right, last question back here. Good morning. I had a question for you, Steve. Uh, I really enjoyed your talk and found it very interesting. And I guess something that I've kind of been wondering as I've been working here at the Center of the West and hearing all this about Buffalo Bill, and you seem to peel back another layer of Buffalo Bill in the Wild West every day. Uh, I guess that I'm curious uh, about how much of the image of the Lakota and, of course, of Plains people. Um, how much of that could have been portrayed differently, uh, maybe by Buffalo Bill, if you have any sort of inkling of that? Because, um, you know, certainly going back and looking at the shows and everything, there's a lot of stereotypes, misinformation, and uh, real racialized versions of uh, history that we see um, through the show. And despite the fact that a lot of Lakota people, uh, you know, for whatever reason, were sort of incorporated into that system. I wonder, you know, Lakota input was limited by what, uh, you know, how they could portray themselves was limited by Buffalo Bill and by the show and all of that. So I guess my question is, how much was Buffalo Bill limited uh, in the stories that he could tell about Lakota people by other forces? Um, because we hear that he for example, learns more, makes better connections with uh, some of the Lakota performers over time. So how much, uh, how much control did he have over that, or how much was the narrative that he was given pressured by other people, maybe by the other shows, if you could answer that? Well, there's a, there's a lot to answer with that. One of the things that's kind of interesting is John Burke himself, uh, when he would talk, and admittedly he was a press agent, but he would say, and uh, this might need some more testing, that the Lakota developed their performances themselves. That uh, this, this was repeated, I think, by Buffalo Bill. That, that they, that now obviously they were given, given parameters, but th they were given a fair amount of opportunity to tell their story the way they wanted. Um, one of the things that's kind of interesting to me as you look at the progression over that 50 years of performance in Europe, and you see this reflected in the United States, is initially they're really emphasizing that which was most recent, the, the wars, the battles, and all of that. But gradually, and certainly by the time you get to 1935, nobody really is interested in talking about those battles anymore. They're not interested in witnessing that. They're more interested in learning about Lakota culture as it is indeed is, is presented uh, by Buffalo Bill and by the other Wild West shows. There is a level of performance there where it's cleaned up, it's changed. Uh, they are obviously playing to the audience. And quite frankly, that's what we all do. Uh, I chose not to uh, wear a tie and a suit, not only because I don't like them, but I thought this might play to my audience a little better wearing a Western kind of uh, outfit. And I think that's what performance involves to some degree. So that was, maybe it was the performance nature of it that might have dictated and controlled some of that. But certainly as far as the US government was concerned, one of their big anxieties and the things they did not like was they could not control the Lakota performance as practiced in the Wild West shows. And that's what I've really tried to explore is how much power did the Wild West shows give to the Lakota according to the historical records from they themselves, like Luther Standing Bear, who then later on went on actually to help form the Indian Actors Association and advocate for the use of Indians playing Indians in the growing genre of Western movies. And who also said that he, after being on the Wild West show, decided not to stay on the reservation because he felt he could do more for his people appearing around the United States, speaking on behalf of them, not being back on the reservation under the thumb of the Indian agents. So rather than looking at it, this as being maybe some negative stuff, I'm looking at there's a lot of positive there and a lot of potential. Um, looking back on that on the part of Lakota 
and saying, wait a minute, they were not successful in taking our culture away from us. And I think Buffalo Bill helped with that. So, thank you, gentlemen. That was a wonderful session. Rolling. We're only five minutes over. We did good. We did good. So uh, again, we're going to take a break. So we will be back here at 11 o'clock for session two. Uh, restrooms are around the, the corner here outside of the Co. And there should be some drinks up there as well. <laughs>